Puglia, where vegetables and herbs grow in abundance. Its wealth built on the produce from these rich, fertile plains and the industries that developed around its agricultural bounty. Now, we often think of pasta originating in Italy and then spreading across the world, but we constantly see evidence of it coming from other places to end up here. The traditional pasta at Puglia would have most likely come from the south of France with Frederick's Crusaders. Join me to find out what it is. Today, Adam's journey takes him through the rolling hills of Puglia, where he discovers new and interesting ingredients, bakes a traditional bread in an ancient dwelling, and cooks up the local pasta with Michelin chef Leonardo. This is my pilgrimage. Come share the journey with me. Puglia is a garden region, and that's clear from the massive range of vegetables you get in the market. Puglia is a garden region, and it's clear to see that, with a huge amount of local fruit and veg and produce. Vegetables are the most popular ingredients for pasta sauces and probably the most iconic vegetable in Puglia is the lampescone. They are a bulb shaped like onion, but they have much more of a bitter flavour on the palate. I think I'm going to use these a little later on in my pasta recipe. The bitterness of the lampescone and the crunch from the freezer bread is going to make to a very interesting combination. Not only are vegetables a staple of the Puglia diet, bread is also very important. Adam learns from Mario how to make friselle, a famous and delicious type of bread. Throughout Puglia there is a very unique and traditional bread they make called fresa. And it's unique because it's actually twice cooked and shaped like a ring. And today I have Maria and Mario, the local baker, and teach at the local culinary school to show me how it's made. Mario, what are the ingredients to make this bread? So we have flour, salt, water and yeast. What is Mario up to here? Well, he's just putting the, um, the flour on the board. Yes. And then making a big hole in the middle to put all the ingredients in. Okay. And then he's going to mix it all up together. And I love it's all worked by hands, you know, tradition, getting his hands in there. He needs to put the water in to get uh. the... Um, the dough nice and smooth. Okay, and you help the yeast obviously activate as well. Mario, a little bit of oil in the hands, look at this. Okay. So by adding the oil to Mario's hands, he's removed any excess dough that's stuck to his fingers and then he adds it back into the master dough and he really works and gets the flavour into it as well. So Mario is giving it a real workout, getting his muscles flexing, getting the dough nice and smooth. Next step is to let it rest for 20 minutes and then we come back and continue. <laughs> wow, look at that. The dough has tripled in size and now it's time for Murray to show me how to make this very unique shape of the bread. So, Murray, what's Murray doing? He's cutting like a sausage? So he's cutting, yeah, he's cutting like a sausage with the dough the dough uh, in order to make little pieces with his hands, uh, mm. which are about 120 grams each. It's a true art in making this bread. I can really tell that Mario, you know, has been doing this for many years. And there it is. There's the final, the ring. The ring that the freezer is so well known for. And so now he's doing it with two <laughs> hands and now he's doing it with one hand. Now we show so it off. there's two modalities to do this. I don't think I could ever do that. Of but this is Mario, I'll do it with the beginners. <laughs> do your hands. Okay. All right. So, two hands. Let's give this a go. Even baking. Okay, okay. Not bad. Not bad for a first time for a beginner. It's 
Wow. Have a look at that. Oh, hot. Very hot, Murray's telling me. What Murray did tell me before is that he allowed the bread to improve a second time, so the second fermentation, for about an hour, and then you end up with these amazing panini, like bread. And I can hear Murray, when he's cutting into it, that crunch, that firm outside, but then it's nice and soft on the inside. But don't you have a go? You got, Murray, all right? Uh, I know you love to do it, so. <laughs> all right, let me get in there. So watch it, Murray. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, Mario, one second. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. Mm, I couldn't wait. Back into the oven, yes. and we get our final product. Wow. Look at that. Did they ever use the bread in a pasta dish at all? Well, um, we have a tradition mm. where people could afford cheese. Okay. Back in the days, uh, they would use the, the bread as cheese, so it's the cheese of the poor. So that's substitute, okay. Yes, we, usually with anchovies oil. So they'd use the oil from the preserving of the anchovies to fry the bread in it and then sprinkle it over the top of a plate of pasta. That sounds like something I need to do. Mario, I'm done. I mean... Mmm! That would have to be simplicity at its best. Tomatoes, oil, salt, oregano, and bread. Maria, grazie. Grazie a te. Maria, grazie a tutti. After the break, Adam takes his lumpy Shawnian bread to a Michelin chef to see what he can whip up. I'm really looking forward to cooking this dish, Leonardo. What's the name of the dish? The name of this is a uh, cream of uh, cheese, podoli, podoli cheese. Cream cheese, yeah. Yes, with uh, uh, orecchiette, tomato, ce tomato si. cherry, and lampacioni, and bread. It's uh, friselle. So while we're doing this, the cousin Franco is going to make the orecchiette for us and get that going. So what does he have over there? Just water, is it, and farina? Yes, is that water, right? flour and uh, farina, yes. Franco, can you, you make the pasta? Okay. Cream. The cream. 100... Uh, oh, look how rich yes. that cream is. Look at this, how much? Yes, you know 100 grams. Enough? Enough, okay. Excuse 100 that. of this. Okay. Okay. Put that is the cheese? The, the cheese. And what? Podolic cow? cheese. Podolic cheese. One? This is from a cow, okay. Enough? Enough. Okay, stir? Yes. Turn it down. With this, yes, we put because eh, just a bit of water. Water, that's vegetable stock, vegetable isn't it? Vegetable stock, yes. Okay. okay, so we just help thinning out that cream. This is enough, okay? That's we, it, done. Our dish is done. done. Yes. It's too easy. The cream is done. Ah, the cream okay. is done. Now, All right. we put this. Put another like pan on. Yes. Some oil as well. Yes. Okay. Like this. Just okay. one piece of the garlic. One piece of garlic, okay? okay. Then we oh. put. What is this, Leonardo? It is laurel. Laurel? Or, uh, yes, you a call... Laurel, I think back home for us in Australia is like a sweet bay leaf. It's similar to the bay, but it's a bit more sweeter in the smell. No worries. Okay. Another tomato you put in? this one. Yes, the tomato. Okay. These are the lampacioni. Okay. Like this. To me, they look okay. like a shallot, a French shallot. Yes. You clean. So he's taking off the top. We. And then just peeling it like a standard onion. But obviously it's a little bit smaller. You put this in uh, boil, in water. By boil, boiling with, water? Yes, in boiling water. And the result is this one. Look at that. There okay. we go. I'm going to give it a try. Are really... Mm. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Amaro. It's very it bitter. It's yeah. very bitter. Maybe a little it's bit of bitter, sugar. Bitter. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. It's good. In? Yes, in. We need a bit of salt, okay? And we put... Okay. okay. Just a bit water. A bit more of the vegetable stock. So it's we okay. need to let this reduce for a little bit. Franco's just adding the orchette into the boiling water and salted boiling water too. Bring the... Tomato? Yes, no. Bring the orchette you put. Okay. Okay. 
So he's taking the pasta straight out of the water, not straining it, okay? Straight into the hot tomato sauce. So a little bit of cream okay. on the bottom. Yes, here. Yeah. Now you bring this, you put here. Place the pasta in the middle yes, of the plate. in the middle, in the middle. Pasta. More. So adding the frizzelle, this is the bread that I just learned how to make earlier on. Okay, here, like this. So okay. as a chef, I'm seeing what Leonardo's doing right now. So he's put the creamy cheese sauce on the base, the orchetta with the tomato sauce, and then the crunch. As a chef, that's always think about having texture to our dish. So the frizzelle is that crunch to the dish. Perfect. Okay. Now, the only thing to do, Leonardo, is for me to try this dish. Okay, try now. Okay. That is absolutely fantastic, Leonardo. The creamy cheese sauce underneath is nice and voluptuous around my mouth, filling it up. But the tomato is what surprises me with the lump of sugar on it. It's jumped inside the orchette. There. There's a sweetness and then this hint of bitterness. This is the Trulli village of Albero Bello, and Adam arrives here to an excited crowd. The Trulli are a remarkable example of drywall or mortarless construction. a prehistoric building technique still in use in this region. These beautiful trulli of Alberobello have been listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Honor, a pleasure. Coming up, Adam meets Mimo, a very energetic trulli expert. Yeah, I can be your guest in your house for a month. No worries. As you travel southeast, truly dwellings become a real feature of the landscape. I'm amongst the iconic rural buildings of Puglia, and with me is a definite character of this town and a tour guide, Mimo. Ciao, Mimo. Ciao, Adam. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. Mimo, can you tell me a bit about when these buildings were first built and the shape? The oldest cone shaped houses on the planet are in Turkey. Between 1000 1480, they started moving through the Mediterranean area and they arrived in Italy. So the oldest cone-shaped houses yeah. in Italy are on the coast, made on sandstone. The most beautiful ones are the one in Alberobello, made on limestone, learning by doing. Okay. They also discovered that here, on the top of a hill, 400, 16 meters above the sea level, wow. exposed to every single direction of the wind, they said, okay, one wall is not enough. They doubled the wall, so Double. these are the only cone shape that does with two walls. Why they choose this uh, shape? Mm. Because uh, to build a cone is easier than building a dome. Okay. A cone, a ring of stone, on a ring of stone, on a ring of stone, like igloos, yeah. on the top, you can leave it open or not. You have a fire on the side, you close with the pin. But what I'm interested about is what did they eat and how did they cook within these cones? It's very dark inside. Yeah. A giant wall, <laughs> small window, small door, yeah. a giant thermal inertia of the material, constant temperature inside. Warm, yeah. You need to make them a little bit brighter, mm -hmm. you make a fire. Okay. Underneath every single house, there's a cistern to collect the rain. They take Water. rain from the cistern, they boil it, they can drink. And they also cook on fire. Now I'll make a question to you. Mm -hmm. You are in a house with fire. Yes. Conical. Yes. In front of the fireplace, si. hot air goes up into the cone. Dry air. Short chimney outside, mm -hmm. some of the smoke, not enough draft, will stay into the house and the smoke goes into the cone. If into the cone of these houses, mm -hmm. there is dry air yes. and smoke. Yes. Why you store into the cone far from water? Food, of course. Your mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> no, food, you're right. You're put the right. mother-in-law up there and preserve yeah, her, do you? Yeah, into the food, <laughs> she dies. No, no, no. You put food into the corn. Up the top? F at the top. Yeah. Far from water, it doesn't mold. Of course. Hot air goes up and dries food. Smoked Smoke food. Smoked flavor. Also flavor. Uh -huh. And also, smoked food lasts longer. It preserves it. 
Yes. Perfect. So into the cone, food. Underneath your feet, water. Into the system. That was very clever, just like yourself. The, thank you. <laughs> Mimo, thank you very much for all this information. In these small rural villages, we find a special ingredient, dried tomatoes. But it's not these babies I'm interested in, it's actually the next step what happens to them. In a place like Alberobello, there is a tradition being preserved at every single turn, from houses to dances. Adam visits some gorgeous locals to learn about something else that's being preserved, tomatoes. Today I have these four wonderful women that are going to show me a preserving method called pomodoro sotto olio. Sotto olio. Sotto olio. Which basically translates to preserving of the tomatoes. The first beautiful signora has the tomatoes who she's pulled open. On to the second signora who washes the tomatoes in vinegar and pats them dry. On to our third lovely signora, she's basically placing the tomatoes into the jar with some caper berries, mint and a little bit of salt. And the final step, the lovely signora is going to... Io. Alright, I'm going to add... Piano, piano. Piano, piano. So you add the oil as the final step. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Okay, I'm watching, I'm watching the sides. I don't want to overfill it. Piano, piano, piano. Piano, piano, piano. piano, piano, piano. Oh, no. Okay. I'm going to go to the So they're telling me? No, 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 no. Okay. Just a little bit more. Make sure that the tomatoes are totally covered with oil. Okay. Final step, lid on the jar. And I'm going to take these tomatoes and use these a little later on in my final cook. Grazie. I'm getting all of them. Oh, I love it. Still to come, Adam's delicious baked orecchiette and sun-dried tomato recipe. This recipe is inspired by my mate Mario the Baker that showed me how to make the frizzelle bread and the ladies that also taught me how to preserve the beautiful sun-dried tomatoes. It's baked orecchiette with sun-dried tomato and ricotta pesto. For the full list of ingredients and method, visit Adam's Pasta Pilgrimage. The first step to this recipe is to cook our orchette pasta in salted boiling water. Just give that a little stir. So to make my pesto, I'm using some mint. Just strip all the leaves off your mint. Try not to get too much of the stem because it's very coarse and very woody in texture and taste. Some basil, of course what would be a pesto without basil. Our sun-dried tomatoes. One clove of garlic. Some capers, which are nice and salty. Some olive oil, obviously, to help it all bind together. Put a lid on. And just give it a blend. Okay. All right, there we have it. It's all nice and combined together. Super smooth. That's what we're looking for. Now, that's looking obviously a little bit dry. So what I'm going to do is add some ricotta, fresh ricotta. Give it that nice moisture and cheesiness to this dish. Mixing that all together. Splash more of olive oil. A little cracked pepper. Now we need to check out orchette pasta to make sure that it's nice and cooked al dente because we're going to be putting this pasta into the oven for another five to six minutes. So now it's where I need it to be. Straight out of the pasta water. And using a little bit of that water helps thin out our pesto with the cheese there. And I love this orchette, you know, little pig's ears. That's what it's shaped like. And what happens is the pesto gets inside there. Mix all that together, like so. Take out the the bread. I'm just going to break it up with my hands. And this is all for texture and crispy, crunchy pieces on the bottom of the pasta. Take half of your pasta. Yeah, just a little sprinkle of some more parmesan. Your remaining pasta on top. Some more of the frizzelle bread over the top. 
and it needs just a little splash of olive oil. Now, take your pasta into a hot oven about 180 degrees for about five to six minutes until it's all nice and golden brown and then ready to eat. And there you have it, a quick, easy midweek meal. And if you make too much of the pesto, place it in a jar and keep it in the fridge. Adam discovered that Puglia is the food bowl of Italy with its lush green landscape, rich with fertile soil. It's the perfect environment for growing flavorful fruit and vegetables. The pasta that was introduced here, orecchiette, was a perfect partner for the many vegetable-based sauces, as the little ears hold the sauce just like a cup. But what Adam enjoyed the most was the broad smiling faces of the Pugliesi, a community of people at the ready to please. Gone are the gentle rolling hills and fertile plains of Puglia. Next time we are in Basilicata, where the rugged mountains make agriculture challenging. Basilicata is only one of the places in the world where people still live in the dwellings built by their ancestors 9,000 years ago. For the full list of ingredients and method, visit Adam's Pasta Pilgrimage.